Children's Story Time with Auntie Katie is coming soon only on MCBN TT Television. Watching the day unfold Jada books is wonderful It's something, it's something to behold But if you love life as much as I do Put some, put something in the air now And if you love Jada as much as I do Put some, put something in the air Let see your hands up Everybody hands up Everybody hands up I am Maurice Alexander, host of the new series, Know Your Representative, a series dedicated to you, the viewer, knowing your representative and what they do for you. Join me on Wednesday, the 6th of April at 6 p.m. Right here, live on NCBN. Stay tuned. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome once again to NCBN TT, our episode five on knowing your representative. This, knowing your representative, the series. Ladies and gentlemen, in on set and studio with us here this evening is none other than Mr. Nikolai Edwards. He is the managing director of Nikolai Enterpri Edwards Enterprises. Sean Paul Enterprises. Sean Paul Enterprises. The political leader of the Progressive Party, and likewise a youth advocate, and so many other things that we will get in here this evening with him that he will express. As mentioned before, ladies and gentlemen, we express that you um, share and like. We are on Facebook, we are on YouTube. Call a friend, tell someone that we are live here on NCBN TT, and in set with us is Mr. Nikolai Edwards. Mr. Edwards, I want to begin by thanking you for accepting the invitation to be here on set with us onto this series called Knowing Your Representative. It is a series that we um, established to create a platform for young people in particular um, throughout the length and breadth of this country, out of different communities, to share just not only from a political standpoint um, things that they are doing within their community or um, things that they have been doing, but really community activists, youth advocates, persons who have, have that passion to see their community develop and people therein. We, are we have created this platform for them to express and share with us, simply because we believe it is going to create that opportunity to have the sharing amongst and across communities, what goes on in other communities as well. Yeah. And just not to be one-sided politically, sure. all right, um, but to have that that clear and, and level and balance of um, views across the board. So this evening we are having a conversation. It's not screening, <laughs> so I want you to be very comfortable. Um, I'm not going to ask, I'll try not to ask hard questions. I mean, <laughs> yeah? we are crazy. But I think you can handle that. I think you're able to do that. Um, 
I would begin by actually having you express to us um, who you are, sure. um, your passion with regards to youth advo advocacy and politics. Mm -hmm. I myself have known you for a, quite a couple of years. I think we first met at one of the Summit of Americas, or so I think it was in 2009. Yes. Right. And from since then, we stayed connected regards of the sharing and the comparisons that we have with regards to community and youth development. So take sure. us through, Nikolai, with regards to that. Your, 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 the moorings of your passion. Indeed. You know, yes. Um, well, first of all, thank you for, for the invitation to be here. It's really a pleasure. Um, Nicola Edwards, in terms of uh, many times people would see me as the youth advocate, so the young man. Before that, it was Yui. So they <laughs> yes, always yes. knew me to be, to be Mr. Yui when I was in the Guild of Students. But it was, in fact, 2009 when I started my youth advocacy work wow. um, at the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting. There was a Commonwealth Youth Forum and I had been fortunate enough to attend that forum representing Trinidad and Tobago. And it was from that standpoint where I got exposed to other young people from around the world, from around the Commonwealth, who came to Trinidad and Tobago mm -hmm. to attend this conference. And I realized, wait, there are other young people who think like me, who right. want to see progress and development in much the same way that I would like to see, see it. it. So right. when that event finished, and we came back to the reality of, okay, you're doing the regular things. I was looking for opportunities and not finding them for a young person. So it took me fast forward to my time at UE, getting mm -hmm. involved in the Guild of Students. Um, from there, being involved with the Commonwealth Youth Council, representing 1.2 billion young people, wow. having the honor and privilege to serve as a, a temporary independent senator oh, yes. in, uh, and the youngest ever. And also, being on the procurement board and just generally being able to advocate for young people yeah. and for a difference in Trinidad and Tobago. So that's yeah. kind of a synopsis of my journey to this point, of course, starting a political party because I felt as though the two political parties that currently exist just simply doesn't resonate with me. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm hopeful that people could see that as being fine and okay because in a society such as ours, mm -hmm. we have to have diversity. Right. Or we have to have other groupings or opinions that we can align ourselves with. And the two major political parties in country just does not resonate with me and so I decided if I'm not seeing something that I can easily assimilate into mm -hmm. why not create that own space own, and, right. and here we are with the progressive party um, having launched um, three years ago mm -hmm. yeah, back in 2019 uh, uh, right uh, but two years ago sorry mm -hmm. so we are getting uh, of course to the point of people being aware of our policies and our positions it has been a challenge since the last election Mm -hmm. uh, but the work continues. Well, I, I'm glad that you, you, you set the stage, kind of the tones for the, for the political aspect of the conversation which we will in, um, engage in. And because um, I, I, I love to go down that road. Eh? Sure. <laughs> but um, and again, you highlighting what it is, where you came from, and mm. your involvement. Um, very interesting and um, very broad as well too. Mm -hmm. But um, in terms of your family background, would you say that um, what, what really where you drew that passion for? to get involved in youth advocacy and community work, that kind of thing. You know, did you have that support from home? Or sure. Did the fire started there? Because, I mean, I, for the several persons that we have interviewed over the a couple months that we have mm -hmm. started, you know, you hear the strong support of the family, support of parents, support of community that propelled young persons' involvement mm -hmm. into things. So do you have that... Um, and you could share something that some, some of sure. that does. Um, but like most persons growing up in Trinidad and Tobago, you're usually either born in a PNM or a UNC household. <laughs> and, and my household was, was no different. Uh, mm. We would have had a, a PNM background, I guess. Um, but I was never forced into thinking I had to support the party or anything. Right. Um, and in truth and in fact, when I had the first opportunity to vote and I was discussing with my family um, why I was not seeing the People's National mm -hmm. Movement as a viable option, it really was um, what are you what are you talking about kind of moment? Um, <laughs> but the truth, the truth, no, of no, course not. Listen, no, I no, know no. some stories of some people get, and, and that's the thing because it, it's not so extreme. Right. Thankful, right. thankfully, in in my household, um, but it was never I was that I was pushed into politics. Right. I had the privilege yesterday of being the guest speaker at Maryland North secondary, secondary graduation. And I was saying to the students there that 
it is very important to have a strong support system. Now, yes. that support system can either be within the family, it could be within the community, mm -hmm. it could be within the school, you have teachers and so forth. And there especially, I really got the push in school. Right. Um, I attended San Fernando Secondary Comprehensive, which is now San Fernando West Secondary. That's, uh, um, for everyone who is from South Old Tech. Old Tech, well, that's Old right. Tech. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> and um, yeah. while attending Old Tech, I was really pushed to participate in things such as Sanfest, extracurricular activities, right. it built uh, or allowed for my stage presence, for me to have a stage presence That's and right. not be afraid. So it's as if the stars were aligning right. um, to allow me to be in a position that I could represent or yeah. to speak on others' behalf. Mm -hmm. Because it's not that I am striving to be the best politician um, mm -hmm. or have the best party in Trinidad and right. Tobago or, or be necessarily the youngest prime minister these are the things that are not necessarily within my um yes, peripheral, peripheral so to yeah. say but it's a matter of i have the talent i have the skill i have the ability i can speak on behalf of others i understand complex issues and try to break it down for others and that's the kind of person or qualities rather i would hope for in a leader right. so if i'm able to exude these kinds of characteristics then why not put myself in a position, position where right. it can be to the benefit of others okay. and that's the simple thing behind it and you know you i'm glad that you mentioned one of the points you made with regards to the school you came from and i know you're just coming out of the heels or on the heels of of c results um obviously yes there would mm -hmm. have been those who are excited they got their choices that yes. they, they you know they passed for and then there would have been those who were a little somber with regards to where they were um, where they have been placed and um I mean, I applaud the ministry decision with regards to not publishing the the, mm -hmm. um, the results in terms of who came, yes. you know, the rankings and that kind of stuff. Since it does something psychologically to, the, to some young people, but I wanted to speak to because I mean, another aspect of the platform is to really empower and inspire young persons, other young people mm -hmm. who are listening on. Because we have a lot of young persons that locked in, and you know, we tend, we want to ensure that we can inspire them. Um, and as I said, on the heels of the results. You're yeah, glad you mentioned the school, the old tech. Yes. Uh, you know, I mean, as it, it has its own San Fernando what? San Fernando West now? It's San Fernando West, right? Yes. Um, but the, the, the whole stigma of it still is there, and at, at, at least what some people in, will intend to continue. Sure. All right. Um, you go in San Fernando. Oh yeah, yeah, in old tech, mm -hmm. and you know they will tend to pedal on this foolishness of what it was. Yes. And again, here it is. I think you can stand as testimony um, of a product from that. Yes. institution and we you know we could speak to those who may have passed through there mm -hmm. or schools are uh, that are you know that may have had that stigma in the past that it doesn't matter where you pass for correct but is you know the intent yes. and having that you know in, you know motivation to really succeed wherever you are i tell my students in school being a teacher myself that if you sent to hell perform in hell <laughs> <laughs> so i wanted to speak to, you know, sure, to, sure, to sure. you know those young persons because I, again i just felt it in the spirit to share and you know yeah. to raise it when you mention old tech in particular and i know right. there are one or two who i uh, i'm aware of that passed with the school and you know they were like of oh, course mm -hmm. this Alexander, old tech we, yeah, we know about it we hear mm -hmm. about it i say hey, all of the history you sure. know Think so. Yeah, and well, um, at the graduation ceremony yesterday, and even because uh, now is graduation season, yes. and I had the uh, privilege to also be invited to speak as the guest speaker at La Veronica RC um, Primary School in wow. Lopino. Wow. And that was last week Friday. And in both cases, what I was made uh, sure to tell the students, the graduates, is that when I wrote SCA back in 2003, I had passed for San Fernando Secondary Comprehensive. And at that point in time, I did not know that school existed. I, <laughs> it was never one of my choices. I um, so was, was very shocked. <laughs> yeah. Senator. So it was like, what's going on here? <laughs> And I remember my mother um, was attempting to get a, a transfer for me to another school. And it was my grandmother, when I spoke with her, uh, she said that um, there was a reason God put you here. Yes, yes. Um, so I accepted that. And of course, uh, the teachers and, and the principal and stuff was asking my mother to keep me in the school. In the school. Um, so I stayed there, did my five years. And it's so very important to understand it does not matter the school that you pass for. It does not matter the school that you attend 
attend. What matters are the experiences that you gain, the relationships that you develop, uh, the right. skill sets, the talents, right. and you can develop that in any environment. Of course, right. there are some environments that it's more difficult to emerge with those positive characteristics yes. and so forth, yes. and we have to acknowledge that. Mm -hmm. For the most part, we have to change the narrative and the stigma yes. associated with particular schools because Old Tech is not, it does not have a good name, and mm -hmm. it did not have a good name rather uh, the time that I was attending there. Yes. Um, but I am proud to say that I am from Old Tech. That's right. and, and many other persons need to have that same outlook or mm -hmm. perspective because this is the school that helped you to get where you are. Now, you have to accept responsibility if you went to school and played the fool, of, <laughs> yes, course. of course. Of course. Um, because, again, it just does not matter so much so the school, the name, mm -hmm. but how do you use those opportunities? And if I may put in a plug as well, too, for um, persons, others who would have gone through those systems, and, and like the junior sex system in particular, yeah. I'm a product of the junior sex system that some people, you know, shun, sure. shame on. Um, I mean, things shame on, but the thing is, I, I, I would put in the plug to encourage Past students from these institutions yes. to get more involved Correct. into these institutions because I, I, I'm seeing those um, areas or those avenues as they are stakeholders in the school, you know, the past students' associations, yes. um, alumni, and, and, and old boys in some instances. Mm -hmm. um, having persons go back, you know, to really contribute towards the mm -hmm. development and inspiration and encouragement to the the present batch of students in those institutions, I think is something that will do well. Of course. You know, the, the issues that we have in our school system right now in terms of violence, in terms of lack of morality and, and, and um, uh, motivation and mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. I think past students, students who have gone through those mills, been successful and are testimonies right mm -hmm. now, can in fact or should in fact go back and share. That is, a, that is one step towards assisting the whole yes. in improving the education system because and I'm saying that there, that is a serious, serious problem right mm -hmm. now. And you see, the, one of the biggest problems that we have is not, um, as it relates to the education system, it's yeah. not one that is indigenous to it. Yeah. It's, uh, it. It's seen as a microcosm of the wider society, society of insofar as <laughs> we don't properly resource the stakeholders who are involved in education for them to be able to fully um, uh, fulfill their function and their mandate. Yeah. So for instance, you go to certain schools, you inquire about the Past People's Association, it may be non-existent. You go to other schools, you inquire about the PTA, it's non-functioning, wow. or they meet once every six months or wow. whatever it is. Well, if we start to tackle those issues or, or really get down to understand why is there not a Past People's Association, why is the PTA, in it, PTA not functioning, um, the community groups around the school and stuff not really uh, stepping up to the police, if we start to tackle the issues from there, and it's really a matter of institutional strengthening yes. or capacity building, yes. however, which you, you want to uh, look mm -hmm. at it, but properly setting up these bodies or entities to do the job for which right. they are to be set up for will further enhance the experience that the students themselves get while at school. Because if you have a more engaged PTA, right. then teachers um, can now interact with parents in a more meaningful, meaningful way. way. Yes. The parents get to understand the challenges in the school system. The teachers, on the other hand, may realize these are some of the uh, trends or the experiences of parents. So let's try to see how we can work hand in hand. Mm -hmm. Past People's Association. If you have these same past people associations uh, donating once mm -hmm. every month, so, so you have the, the membership putting forward at $50 and you have, um, let's say, hundreds yes. of uh, past pupils, that will add up at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. So, of course, we have to tackle it frontally in yes. the school, the violence that is, and the low morale and stuff. Mm -hmm. But look on the periphery at the, the uh, fringe groups, the organizations, the stakeholders, yes. help them up to prop up themselves and they will in turn prop up the I schools. mean, definitely I would invite you on another occasion for us to really delve a little deeper into the education system sure. in particular because, I mean, I know your interest where education is concerned and your involvement from, from looking at your involvement with regards to UWE. Yeah. Um, I mean, I have my, my own is, um, opinions as well and suggestions regarding the very systematic um, structures sure. of the system. And I think mm. needs to be addressed. And in Got some sense, and I mean, push the, the envelope even further, that needs to be eradicated. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. Archaic, you yeah. know? And I think, um, you know, that is a, that's, that's a need and now, mm -hmm. right, to, to review and to get rid of. Because I think a lot of that is, is burdening um, the system, yes. um, the, the students within the system, and it's causing 
it's, it's not causing that fluidity that you, we speak about, but we would want the system yeah. to be, and that we want the expectation of the student, um, of the young people within the system. Correct. So, you know, I, I'm glad that you made mention of the, <laughs> the stakeholders and the system itself, my friend, because clearly there needs to be a review on that. Um, what would you say to, because it's a question I have been asking all interviewees, mm -hmm. you know, I have asked them, you know, apart from the involvement with the community and that kind of stuff, and you have said that, um, your experience and the involvement with your family, strong mm -hmm. community, but encouraging other young um, people with, um, with in community work volunteerism. Yeah. You know, far too many times we have young persons, um, when you ask them to get involved or if you encourage them to get involved, the first question is, what is it for me? What I can get out of it? Or the, the intention of getting involved is about an agenda for themselves. Mm -hmm. um, speak to, because again, I, I, I am passionate about that because, you know, us young people who put our hands to the plow to get involved in, in community work and in youth advocacy is mm -hmm. not something that is easy at all. Mm -hmm. Sometimes mm -hmm. we end up on the, on the bad end of the stick, yeah. right? Um, having to go through all the mill and then end up, you know, and sometimes people see that and they tend to shun away and they mm -hmm. or shy away from it. What would you say, um, or how you encourage young people to get themselves involved and not to shy away, right, given the negatives. Mm -hmm. And I want to f a, a specific focus on young men because I, you know, believe that there are a lot of young men who have, they, they don't get involved, they don't want to get involved in community mm -hmm. work at all, period. Mm -hmm. all right? And I think that has, that has been on the decline. And as a young man, all right, who could have been somewhere in some yacht, somewhere with, a, with your family, or, you know, your children, or sure. <laughs> you know, here it is, you are, you are dedicating your life yeah. to service. Speak to that. Speak to that. Person. You see, the, the challenge in getting people involved is that they have to be passionate about whatever work they're getting involved in. Because if there is not that passion, then I will not want to subject someone to do something that they Wait. don't really care for. You understand? Yes. Um, that doesn't mean that there isn't the need for the kind of work or the involvement or the assistance of these individuals. Mm -hmm. But we have to find out from them what are the things they are passionate about and try to navigate them or draw them toward those things. Yes. Um, we have not really a good culture when it comes to um, proper volunteerism in this country. Mm -hmm. The volunteerism, and I've said this on many uh, um, a platform, where volunteerism is seen as this uh, almost highfalutin thing <laughs> where someone who is well-to-do has some extra time on their hands, so they'll mm -hmm. go down to the shelter and volunteer. Or they'll decide to go and um, join a, a, a walk -a in the area. Uh, and those are the ways that people see volunteerism right. or, or, or um, getting active in the community, community. and so forth. Uh, it's not to say that we have properly functioning shelters in the country right. that on any given Sunday you see a flock of people coming and, and giving support. They are, but these shelters and these spaces are not being properly um, brought to the attention of, to, of the wider community. Yeah. And also it has to be something that affects the heart of the individuals who are getting wow. involved, as yes. I'm saying. So when we think about young men, let's say the young men on the proverbial block. Yes. Yeah. Um, as opposed to simply pointing fingers and saying they're lazy and they're this, that, and the other, we have to go up to them and engage them right. and inquire That's of right. them what, um, uh, what do they want to get involved in. It's nice to have the MILAT and the MIPART and, and the MIC set up and the NESC and all of these different uh, yeah. institutions and, and stuff. But at the end of the day, if that's not where the interest of these individuals lie, it will be very difficult for them to be motivated <laughs> and no right. stipend will do the job. We have to be responsive to the needs of the people in society That's because, right. and I said this um, to, to some students, the jobs that are going to be booming in possibly the next five and ten years have probably not been thought of as yet. That's right. So we have to start to, to, to interact with our young people in society, find out uh, what are the things that they are interested in, and let's see how we could spring up industries around yes. that. Um, yes. the, the metaverse, people will have different views about it, but that's something that is going to come about and yeah. it's already starting to build. Are we preparing our population to be as um, computer savvy and, mm -hmm. and, and literate yes. and, and so forth to participate in that because if we're not doing that we're doing our citizens an injustice yes. it's not about just coming in as a party and this is a, any government and simply saying well this is our manifesto and we're yes, going to yeah. do this and, and this alone this, we're gonna, yes, we're gonna no one 
had in their manifesto that COVID-19 was going to be something of they were course. going to tackle. <laughs> you understand? So you Correct. have to shift, you have to change, you have to accommodate, yes. and you have to be responsive. And I like the point you make about really having that proper assessment and evaluation in regards to what um, particularly young people may need. I mm -hmm. mean, it may not be the normal cut and trust of, okay, they have no education, so you will find some way to get them some education. Yeah. All right? Um, like, I mean, the, the attempt of the Ministry of Education for those students who didn't pass mm -hmm. to, in two months to give them some, some little crash thing to yeah. put them into a secondary school in September. I mean, I'm glad to hear so many stakeholders who pointed out that that is impossible mm -hmm. to really be able, over the two-month period, to really assess truly what these children were going through for two years. Yeah. All yeah. right? And I hope that they review that and um, that sort of thing. So, but the innovation with regards to are we preparing, you may mention to that, our citizenry for that out of the box thing mm -hmm. that is likely to, you know, swarm not just only our society but the world that is happening now. Yes. You know, are we prepared to to see um, you know, music in a particular way, mm -hmm. or quality in a particular way mm -hmm. that um, it is the next oil and gas? Yes. All right. Are we prepared for that? So I'm saying that there, that discussion has to happen and just not happen as consultation that mm -hmm. we call one or two stakeholders over a weekend or a week period and just regurgitate a lot of stuff that was done and bring paper from this one and that mm -hmm. one. But really, you know, have meaningful discourse, timelined and implement, all right, you know, structured and you know, determined, you know, very determined. I, I was, I, I'm fed up of the consultation. Yes, yes, yes. And in just it's, it's terminology. We consulted with mm -hmm. the very implementation part of the thing. It goes to a lot of other stuff <laughs> in the country. But let me, in, um, in engaging our, our viewing public, you know, remind you that we do, we will be taking calls. Um, our number, which should show up on the screen anytime soon, 309-8924, 309 309-8924. Two four. Um, we are again. Uh, we are live on Facebook, YouTube, and on Instagram as well. NCBNTT. Um, feel free to share and welcome someone. We are with none other than Mr. Nikolai Edwards. Nikolai. So we're getting there into that realm of the politics. Sure. <laughs> All right. But before that, though, I would want to. I, I see that you are managing director of Jean Paul Enterprises Limited, mm -hmm. which again speaks to um, young people and in, in entrepreneurship. And again, I'm I'm praising you for for taking that that leap mm -hmm. into that sphere because again, there are young people who may want to get into that sphere but are afraid and timid to get mm -hmm. in that. You know, like you could speak into inspiring and encouraging them into not shying away from well, that. But tell us about the sure. Your, well, your, actually, you know. I would love to inspire young people and motivate them to, to become entrepreneurial and so forth. But the reality is, the harsh reality is that Trinidad and Tobago does not do sufficiently well when it comes to resourcing or supporting our entrepreneurs. And I can give you a wow. story, a personal story, which I wouldn't delve into. Mm -hmm. But uh, the fact is that our financial institutions, our local banking yes. institutions and so forth, are clearly not set up with community in mind. Yes, you may see them deciding to uh, support certain causes and, and all of that as part yeah. of their corporate social responsibility. Mm -hmm. But when we think about empowering people, um, that's where I would quicker see things such as credit unions being there in uh, communities to assist different wow. groupings of individuals. Um, but even the credit unions are not themselves properly resourced. Yeah. Um, I was elected to the board of directors of Western United Credit Union, mm -hmm. which is located in uh, off of Arapita Avenue on Fitch Street. And me getting there and seeing how a credit union operates and so forth, I see the power and the potential of, 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 of these credit unions. But the fact is that- They're still limited. They are. And even more than that, as a society, we don't engage in financial literacy in a real tangible way. This is where we need to be using the education system, right. for instance. You get people to understand the importance of saving, um, the, the importance of um, putting away for, for, for a rainy day, day, but yes. also taking um, life insurance and all of these different things. 
paying your taxes. Yes. The average young person does not understand that we do have that system it, in place. It's amazing. <laughs> don't cut you, but yeah. it's amazing to, uh, to hear that there are some young people who don't even know the importance of, I mean, they're working, some mm -hmm. of them are working, but the importance of paying your NIS. Yeah. Or ensuring that the employer well, pay your NIS. Yeah, and, but let me tell you, if it is that we can have people making statements on platforms and so forth, saying the government will do nothing for me, we hear this quite often, Correct. then it shouldn't be surprising for you to understand that people don't understand the importance of paying taxes. Because yes. at the end of the day, it's those same tax-paying dollars that find their way somehow or the other back into your pocket mm -hmm. or impact on you in a, a particular way. Of course, the process is not smooth, smooth far yes. from. Yes. Um, but we have to be able to educate our society in a way that we've not engaged in for quite some, some time. time. And the question always is, whose responsibility is, is it? it? Whose responsibility it is to motivate and inspire entrepreneurs as we're seeing yeah. whose responsibility it is to think about the new industries and, and, and how we're going to regulate that and put systems in place we're always asking these questions but it does not seem as though we have a clear answer right. and the clear answer is all of us it is all of our responsibility we have to be able with these experiences that we have to go out there and tell people about them right. and you would realize. find that there are other people who are having similar experiences yes. and that's how the community organizing starts really because people start to come together and say yes I am also affected or afflicted by this what can we, we do, do. and right. you start doing your research you realize okay we have the financial ombudsman we have this we have that you can go to your counselor you can go to your representative That's and right. you start channeling it up the ranks so That's to right. see yeah. and then it will find its way hopefully with enough support before the cabinet right. and the government makes a policy decision, it turns into legislation or what have you, and that's how we really are supposed to be agitating in and the country. I, and, and that is exactly what I, I believe is the key. Mm -hmm. Rank yeah. and file from down up. Mm -hmm. All right, and, and to get that, it really requires that evangelism and that education outward, you yes. know, within the communities and throughout the lengths and breadth of different areas. Mm -hmm. All right, because again, I mean, when I, I just talking from my experience as a local government representative um, some years ago, um, I, I saw myself beyond just the box drain and advocating for somebody to be get a, get a pay mm -hmm. or wanting a food card. But within all that as being part of the responsibility, I saw myself as that um, individual to really share information. Yes. Because I know we, we are, I kept that mantra that information reduces risk. With the more information that you have, you are able to make better decisions and, and informed decisions, that is. So we, 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 we went on there literally educating people throughout a whole plethora of things. Um, it was amazing to hear people not understanding the difference between local election and, and general election. Mm -hmm. Persons not understanding that the importance of that they are, um, they can vote for local. Yeah. Only thought that only knew that they uh, probably could have only voted for general. Mm -hmm. So simple things like that. All right, the ombudsman, as you said, the financial ombudsman, the ombudsman on the whole. Mm -hmm. You know, so when we you know embarked on those things, it was amazing. And I'm talking just not only young people, you know, but there were senior people yeah. within communities that didn't even understand those things. So I think a, a, a greater interest needs to be placed on the information sharing and ensuring that throughout the communities people really get that information mm -hmm. because from time to time today you have governments will say but we did this but we, we have look, look at here we have it in the manifesto we, we had a, a consultation yeah. you come back to that yeah. same word um we had a, 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 a what do you call it a public meeting mm -hmm. and we, we spoke on that but did that really reach down mm -hmm. to who it matters most and ensuring that, that that kind of synergy takes place. So I am, I am really agreeing to that point that I, and I trust that those who are listening on, listening on here, um, whether local, even um, um, central government, will really find the need to do systems like that. All right? Um, so I'm glad that you made mention of that need too as well to Nikolai with regards to um, financial ed education and literacy mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. the school system. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> I think I heard somebody made, me, um, I saw on, on Facebook somebody making a recommendation that entrepreneurship should be taught. Mm -hmm. Remove um, POB and deal with entrepreneurship in school. But you see, is is not even just a matter of teaching entrepreneurship. It's a matter of teaching civics, life skills. Uh, and we have systems in place already for that in wow. school. We're not utilizing it. We have the uh, health and family life education program, which many people, I'm sure, are hearing that term for the first time right now. That's within that we find 
comprehensive sexuality education. Wow. That seems to be the bigger buzzword and the thing that people would respond to. But we have an entire program called Health and Family Life Education throughout the secondary school system. The challenge is, is that teachers who are assigned those roles and responsibilities for teaching the course material, it is voluntary. It is not mandatory. Wow. So you, no one aspires or says, well, you know, I am going to be uh, an HFLE teacher one day. You would quicker <laughs> say, you know, I like math, so I'll be a math teacher, teacher. an English teacher, a, a social <laughs> studies teacher, whatever it is. But there is not so much emphasis by the Ministry of Education, at least from where I sit and from where I see, uh, to really drive health and family life education, uh, home and comprehensive sexuality education. Because if we utilize those models uh, or those curricula, what we can do is effectively change the culture throughout society. Yeah. Um, a lot of the times we tend to focus on what we're seeing now and it causes us to forget what is about to come. And what I mean by that is that we're trying to fix the issues now and how it impacts or affects us now, but think more clearly about if we put these systems in place, the generations to come to would come. benefit That's from right. it, That's you understand? Right. It's just like policing or how we tackle crime. We have to accept that there is just a fraction of offenders who we can't do anything for them essentially right now. Mm -hmm. Whether it's a lack of resources, whether it's a lack of policy decisions or whatnot. Mm -hmm. What we can do is put systems in place through community work, through wow. the education system, through the different areas to prevent a generation of perpetrators from That's coming correct. about. That's and correct. it has to work hand in hand That's because correct. you're taking the frontal approach, you're, you're detecting crime, you're, yes. you're predicting and so forth, but you're also looking at uh, preventing Crime That's from right. taking place mm -hmm. uh, and more on a psychological level. And you're right, I, I have also said uh, many times in the community when they had these town hall meetings that we deal with the outcome of crime. Mm -hmm. You know, when or the murders, that's when it already happened, mm -hmm. the, the, the um, larceny, when it already happens. Mm -hmm. But the, the, the source of the thing, before it lead up to murder, where is the work being done to, to, to treat with those things? Mm -hmm. not, not when it done break out. The cancer yeah. done break out already and you're now coming to do chemo. Mm -hmm. Listen to me, let us assess the body before to, in, to, to detect if there are signs yes. of um, over, more, more, there are too many cancer cells, that mm -hmm. kind of thing, you know? And um, you but would hear them say, give you the example, but they, have no, they, they don't have enough resources. And yeah. all those we excuses. will never <laughs> have enough resources. Well, that's a good point, yeah. but point. Yeah, <laughs> but I, I, I want to jump in with you another example for instance we look at road fatalities um, the amount of accidents that are taking place and we think to ourselves that the answer to it really has to do with putting penalties in place yes. now they are effective to a point mm -hmm. eh? I'll tell you that when um, I can't remember how many years ago it was but we really started to enforce the seatbelt um, policy, policy. Or, or whatnot and you saw the fines for that increasing and everyone you jump in a taxi the taxi the driver seeing a pony and seat belt. Um, yeah, that, well, so, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. so it began a culture, all right? So what I'm saying is that if we put um, penalties and so forth, we make things or offenses, it does have an impact. But if we really want to prevent people from getting into the kinds of accidents that they're getting involved in, we have to look at driver's education. Yes. The driver's education that is offered at licensing office throughout the country is subpar at best. Yeah. You go there, you read this booklet, um, and you go write a multiple choice. Mm -hmm. And you drive within the yard, you go out, what have you. <laughs> that is not any kind of impactful driver's and education. And those who don't even read the book. Yeah, of course. <laughs> so, so those who are going and peeing on the side and yes, so forth and correct. getting their license. Uh, but my point really is that we have to stop looking at it in this linear fashion yes. and we have to see the wider picture and what systems we can put in place to change culture, culture. Yeah. more than yeah. anything. So it, it's a culture of crime that has crept into society yes, and, and we have to change that culture right. um, if you want to be successful. And that, yeah, you're right, you hit the nail on the head. Um, we want to take a break actually and um, Director, <laughs> no break? All right. Well, that, they're giving us a signal that we can go right on. But um, so I started, I asked you a question in regards to the Jean Paul Enterprises. Yes. So, what is this exactly Jean Paul is right. involved in? So, it was 
after kind of go back to me <laughs> leaving school, um, my first job outside of school, secondary school, was at a herbal store in Carlton Center, San Fernando. Yeah. Um, and I was working there for some time and really interested because of the owner of the store, Calvin Latroy. He was such an impactful person or influential person on my life because of the time that we spent there seeing him as really a father figure wow. um, and espousing a lot of knowledge. It was like as if I was the son that he didn't have right. um, and I greatly appreciated that. And so he showed me more or less the tricks of the trade. He told me who the suppliers for the items because these were herbal soaps and creams and lotions, different weight loss teas, all these wow. things. And I started doing my own thing with his blessing of course, going up and down High Street with a bag on my back, selling <laughs> these products, going from store to store. And at one point, I was selling in the Marabella market for and, um, like a good while. I was selling there, getting up there early. Um, and one time, within a space of four hours from selling products, black soup and so forth, um, I made a thousand dollars. So from there, it was a store on the coffee that I had. And Japol Enterprises was the business name that no. I had set up and everything right. that I had set up to do that. So I was doing that for quite some time. Media, which is honestly my first passion, came wow. knocking on my door and I answered that and I went working at the Government Information Services Limited at that point. But prior to that I was working at um, Radio Vision, which is Boom Champions 94.1 and um, Power 102. Right. Uh, from there I worked at Win TV, Win Radio yes, and I then remember. GISL. I remember that. So working at GISL, uh, I cannot put everything else on hold when it comes to the business. But years later, in the pandemic, uh, I saw the need to revive it. Mm -hmm. So I went and I did a change of status. You know, it became Japol Enterprises Limited. And at that juncture, the focus was on sanitization. How can we lend support to the efforts across the country? And we had a contract with um, a local uh, private hospital, the Trinidad Eye Clinic. Mm -hmm. And we worked, we worked with them for some time. So it was me morphing the business and still trying to figure out what exactly <laughs> what direction to take it mm -hmm. um, but the latest venture that we're embarking upon is a selfie museum there is one existing already in Trinidad in North Trinidad and my intention is to bring one to South so I already have the space and so forth okay. but the challenge is the funds to finish it to finish. and this is the challenge what, what's the name of the museum a, a selfie, museum. selfie museum so what it is you you pay to go into a space and there are several booths or several backdrops that you go you spend an hour and you take pictures against it uh, and you know this is the generation for that, for the, right? Yeah. When you think about TikTok, when you think about Instagram in particular, those two platforms would benefit the most from a space like that. Mm -hmm. And you go there, you also book a private photographer to follow you around, get those pictures, and every couple of months, the sets change. Wow. So it's always something fresh, something new, and yeah. you have multiple sets. So it was a business venture that I found very, very interesting, and I have been pursuing it, okay. but that's where my where I was saying that from personal experience, yes, yes. it is difficult, <laughs> yeah. and you would imagine or you would think that someone who has been involved as I am, or who is as, um, I don't know, qualified as I am and so forth, would find an easier time than oh. others to get through oh. Oh. with the system, but that's not the case, so I know firsthand. Hmm. I mean, I don't necessarily have to be, uh, as we say, dragging on the ground to understand other people's issues or concerns, just a simple taste of so much bureaucracy, mm -hmm. so much issues, mm -hmm. why is this the case? And these things cause me to push harder, fight harder for the kind of society that I want to see and I know is possible. And gratefully, um, thankfully for you, it, 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 you I mean, you, uh, you have you know, glean from that experience and mm -hmm. um, some more impetus to go forward. But um, you know, there are a lot of other persons who you know you know fall off the on the yeah. fall, off, fall off on the wayside, given the type of bureaucracy, the kind of bureaucracy. Sometimes it's it's sometimes it's, it's like deliberate. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I have uh, had the experience in, in hearing you know, a lot of young people just open my account, mm. just to simply open an account the issues that you have. Yeah. You know, and um, they want to uh, run around, and it's not encouraging. And I, and I think that's the, the term I would want yes. to use. It's not encouraging to have persons want to open business and get involved in entrepreneurship mm -hmm. so that they can be even within the system and, and be recorded and function and that kind of stuff. I don't know, but I trust that someday mm -hmm. that, that could be addressed. But I'm glad that you, you, you 
I like the idea of the um, selfie museum. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's new, <laughs> new to my well, I mean, if any <laughs> investors out there. Well, why are you speaking to that? And therefore, you, you trust that somebody could, um, would, would be you know, willing to come on board you know, to really take the, the thing further. Mm -hmm. um, I want to delve right now to, um, Nikolai, into the political sphere of things. Sure. I mean, you took the, what should I say, you took that leap forward mm -hmm. as um, the others in the, in the past did that as, uh, as well. But you took the leap forward, nothing to, um, you know, being forced to join any particular political party, um, but you saw the need that listen, there's, there's something that needs to be different. There's a need badly mm -hmm. in the political sphere for something different, something mm -hmm. new. And um, even though perhaps you may have been criticized or um, hated upon for doing such, you launched. And I want to say publicly here that, um, I mean, I would have spoken to you and messaged you with regards to that leap of faith that you mm -hmm. took then. Um, some people may, felt, may have felt it would have been too ambitious, but I saw that as, yes, you're the odd one, but you know, sometimes it's the odd one that makes the difference. Yeah. All right, I'm not in the crowd. Mm -hmm. And I want to congratulate you for doing such. I mean, I can, I feel, feel that in myself too with regards to the politics and the, and, and the, in the atmosphere of this, at this time, there is a need for something different. Yeah. There's a need for something that is new. I think the young people in particular, are crying out for that. Mm -hmm. um, I would say again openly, I'm fed up of what is yeah. for polit passing for politics at yes. this time. Yeah. All right, and um, the time, and space is now for young people to come forward. Mm -hmm. Not being afraid, come forward. Not being outside and complaining, but putting your hand to the wheel and helping that wheel spin. Mm -hmm. You did that. Speak to us on that journey. Um, you're the party as in, at this time, what you're all embarking upon. Sure. And um, yes. Well, the <laughs> decision to, to, to <laughs> launch a political party was not an easy one. Because of course, you, this was something that I had to discuss with my family. Mm -hmm. It was not a decision that I could have made on my own because whatever I did from that point onward would have had an impact on the people around me. Yes. Um, and I had to make sure that they were prepared for what was to come. And trust me, things did come. <laughs> yeah. um, but it was something that I felt in my gut was the right thing to do. Right. And you know, especially for people who are, let's say, religious, and at the same time, within the political sphere, strong supporters, it baffles me that they find it difficult to understand that sometimes when you get your calling, you have to answer. Yep. Because if you want to put it in that kind of philosophical and theological kind of underpinning, and I just felt as though this was what I was being called to do. Right. It had nothing to do with me wanting to spite PNM or spite UNC. Yes, and yes. I feel as though because of the adversarial nature of, of politics, politics in Trinidad yes, and Tobago in particular, um, people always feel as though you're only doing this to be... Because yeah, yeah. Uh, to, to fight down this yeah. one or that one. You're a, a PNM um, B team or UNC B team. Yes. It has nothing to do with that. Okay. There are simply citizens in your beloved Trinidad and Tobago right. who do not agree with the status quo mm -hmm. and they're doing something to That's make a right. difference. When we think about people, and, and I know that a lot of times we want to um, laugh or point fingers or, or put down. Uh, we have to talk about the Errol Fabians, the um, Philip Edward Alexanders. Yes. We have to talk about the David Abdullahs, yes. the uh, Carolyn Cipasad Beaches, and so many other people, yes. Fuad yeah. Abu Bakr. Um, oh all of God. these are individuals yes. who, whether you choose to like them or not, they are doing something yes. in the society. And I hear the question that many people tend, and I heard it today on the radio, um, people are asking, well, who else? Who, who else is yes. available? And, and so forth. Yes. Um, it, it's, it's not even a matter of just plain foolishness because I think that's an no, easy I, I, couple. No, I, I, yeah. I understand what yes. you're saying, that's but it, the, the thing is, people are also not opening up their minds yes. to the possibility that something else as exists. exists. That's right. Because they believe as well. If something else exists, it has to be nice and shiny and polished Looking and like. everything is ready to go. That's not the reality that alternative parties face because yes. these individuals have to find money just as the major political mm -hmm. parties do mm -hmm. and it will obviously be more difficult for them. Yes. They have to find ways to reach the masses. I will give you, I, I will tell you this. Since the 2020 general election, um, it has been particularly difficult for the Progressive Party and other alternative parties. And people are quick to say, well, I don't see this one, and I don't see that one, well, and I don't hear from one. this one, yes. and so yes. forth. 
to see and to hear the alternative parties is not a cheap thing. Yes. It needs resources. People feel as though you can easily muster up a group of people and walk in a community, go house to house. We are Trinbigonians, we just complain about the hot sun. Yeah. <laughs> and the reality is that those political parties that are out there who've been doing this for years, they have their loyalists. Yeah. They have their people who, if the party says, come out in the morning, they are ready and willing because they've somehow dedicated their life to, to these it, political yes. parties. Alternative parties don't have that rapport, they have to build it. So this is real-time building of a political party in a society that is not kind mm -hmm. to alternative parties, as we say, third parties and, yeah. and what have you. So that's just the reality of the situation but right now. But as you now. said, you know, the, the not kind um, to alternative parties have a lot to do really with the culture. Mm -hmm. All right? mm -hmm. and, and you made mention earlier with regards to persons thinking outside of the box that this thing could exist. Yeah. There is something other than the PNM and the UNC. Mm -hmm. There is something other than what is for politics now. All right? um, there can be. Yes. But again, is that trust? Is that belief? Is that understanding that there is something beyond that line there? But is if you are willing mm -hmm. to step forward, who shall go before us? As I said, you know, the, the mm -hmm. proverbial um, term, who shall go before us? And therefore, mm -hmm. everybody asking, watching, you know, winking eyes, you know, choking this one, choking yeah. everybody, everybody don't want to go forward because they don't want to be bashed, they don't want to be criticized. But even more than that, I think there are those individuals who don't see the importance of their involvement in the establishment or the building up of these institutions, these parties um, supporting a candidate before they even hit the point of a platform. Look amongst you, look at your neighbor, look at your, those people in your community, mm -hmm. um, in your workplace, see if they have qualities that uh, you can really get behind and you suggest to them, listen, you ever thought about getting into representation, not just politics, eh? yes, representation. That's it, that's it. Have you ever thought about um, even at the level of the union, because you can be in the public service in a job and you want to get involved to advocate for the betterment of those around you. Yes. And, and that's really what politics should be. Mm -hmm. It should not be about those getting involved to enrich themselves and so forth. Mm -hmm. Now, I would say, because I am very balanced, or at least I try to be very balanced, in my um, uh, dissecting and, and mm -hmm. so forth of things around me. We give politicians a lot more credit than they deserve. <laughs> and when I say that, I'm <laughs> actually talking about we quick to point fingers at the politicians and say they're not doing this and they're not doing that and the yes. other and we're giving them more credit than they deserve yes. because the fact is many of them are doing the hard work. Mm -hmm. But our concept of what a politician should be doing is far different from the realities. Mm -hmm. And the same politicians are the ones who kind of push that thinking because I find it very hard to believe that a politician, uh, a minister, is not getting up, going to work doing, well, it's not even an eight-hour day, mm -hmm. probably 10 hours and 12 hours, and just wasting time. There are things that go on that we don't see, yes. all right? Yeah. Um, and that's how work works. <laughs> because when your parents go to work, you are at home, you're not seeing what their day is like, you're not seeing the challenges that they are facing, you're not seeing the wins that, that they are. are walking away with. Mm -hmm. We just know that our parents mm -hmm. are going to work. Going to work. Yeah. And when they come home, they might be tired, so they can't attend to us or, or whatnot. And then we might say they're bad parents. Yes. But the reality yes. is they're killing all self in work yeah. and still trying to come home so and put food on the table, table and so forth. Of course, this is a very kind um, picture of a of politician. A politician. Yeah, yeah. But um, the, reality <laughs> is, the reality is that we have to be balanced in how yes. we view these yes. things yes. because the quicker we get to see that politicians are real people, just like you and I, oh, yes. just like everybody else, yes. the quicker we can start to see ourselves in those positions Position. of um, politics and, and representation in ministerial positions because we can't think that a special breed of people have to come forth and to go and fill those 41 seats in <laughs> the lower house. The point, you made that point, I remember uh, Ariel sitting there, Ariel Saunders, mm -hmm. who himself to a, a, a young man who I am glad that you know took that step and that leap of faith yes. um, two years ago, I think it was at the by-election, mm -hmm. no, a year ago in the by-election in Moruga yes. as an independent candidate and you know he created a lot of waves down in Moruga, I was following him there. And you know, he, he came here and you know, he made mention that we, we view politi politicians as though they came from this politi politician land. Yeah. You know, we're expecting them to come from somewhere else, yeah. you know, some next planet. 
but they are from among us mm -hmm. and therefore we have to view the thing differently we have to view our our role too mm -hmm. um even though we place the 41 persons there in parliament we have a role mm -hmm. because i i always used to say to my burgesses that in fact you are not going to elect me and then when you elect me you fold your arms and say okay council what are you going to do for me yes. but you are we are going to work together to do to do what is necessary for all of us yes. all right and that requires you giving that support to ensure that i am your voice in there to gain that kind of success that you wish as um, as Buddhists. So you know that philosophy and concept that us as people need to understand that as well too. So the Progressive Party, Nicolai, stands for, and I mean you may not be able to give me your whole manifesto here, but there are yeah. key things I'm guessing that you would have launched out at when you mm -hmm. formed, when you started. Mm -hmm. um, I know you're, I would want to hear want you to share a little bit uh, you had contested the San Fernando West seat. Yes. Which is um, against um, the incumbent Farrah Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, you could probably share the experience there too as how that went down, yeah. all right? Um, I know it was very civil, <laughs> some yeah, of it. Yeah. But um, the progressive party. I mean, and, and I, I see Faris all the time, and, and we speak. Uh, he's trying to woo me to, to come up <laughs> on that side, but uh, I don't know. You have a tough fight on his hands there. Um, but one of the things that I always told people is that I am not running against Faris. It's Great. that this is not what the fight is about. It's That's not right. about trying to displace a PNM or displace Faris Alwari. It's about listen, I feel as though representation means something different than it may mean from you. Right. And if given the opportunity to represent my constituency, this is how I would do it. That's right. And so I offered my hat in the ring for the people of San Fernando West. So it was never, yeah, one day I'm going to go up and, and beat Paris yes, and, and, yeah, and stuff yeah. that. They could have put whomsoever there. Right. And, and a lot of the times people came up to me and say, well, why you decide to run for San Fernando? This is where I live in. Yeah, of course. Yeah. I am not going to represent Port of Spain South or, or Shogunas West or, or what have you. I'm going to represent home because at the end of the day, it is about seeing betterment for my community first and foremost. Yes. And of course, I have to be selfish because I want to take care of my community first. Yeah. And that's what you should be pushing, I think, as um, the representative for whatever constituency. You have the greater um, um, outlook of the country at, at, at stake. So you're thinking about how can I develop Trinidad and to be as a whole but charity starts at home yes. and so if you know every day because you're living in the constituency you have to drive over potholes this that and the other then these causes become personal for you with the greatest of respect Faris Alwari does not live in San Fernando West. Mm -hmm. So he may not experience the same things that the constituents experience. Of course, yeah. he will come down and, and interact. And I felt strongly that the representative for San Fernando West, for my constituency, should be from my constituency. constituency. And I tossed my hat in the ring. Of course, it did not work out in my favor. But there were many lessons to be learned. Great. And I'm so yeah. grateful for those lessons. Um, it, generally, the Progressive Party, we believe in progressivism or uh, social policies as really being the driving force of how we're going to shape the culture of Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, the name alone, because a lot of times people jump up and say, well, PP, and, and no, it's not. <laughs> Just as how I looked at, at the United States, I looked at other countries when I was thinking about what I wanted the party to represent and, and the model and so forth. We know of the Democratic Party and the shortened term, Democrats, the yes. Republican Party, Republicans. So I liked the idea of being referred to the supporters and so forth as progressives because yeah. that's what we are about, progress. progress and yes. so we had the Progressive Party. All right, uh, and the intention always has been about policy, social change. That's how right. can we drive these things forward? Um, how can we go into the community and find out what are the issues and put that into policies or legislation and make the fixes necessary? A, a quick example we saw in Tobago with the PDP. When they entered, one of the first things that they dealt with was the dress code. Correct. Yeah. And that's simple as and that was. It yeah. was simple but effective, effective because yes. at the end of the day, we've all had those experiences yes. where we have to run into a government office, but we have a slipper on our foot mm -hmm. or we in our short pants. We didn't anticipate we had to come in town and do X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. Living in a tropical climate such as ours, why do we take so much offense to the idea of somebody coming with our open But if I may, just on Facebook, um, a while ago, I was going through Facebook. And the, um, the uh, Prime Minister of Jamaica mm -hmm. um, welcomed the, one of the international footballers in one of those um, teams. I, I mm -hmm. can't remember the name of the team. And he played, he's a 
Jamaican born, mm -hmm. and he visit, paid uh, courtesy visit to the Prime Minister. Mm -hmm. um, he, he has been doing over the years, even though he's playing international pro football, mm -hmm. he has been doing a lot for football in Jamaica. And the gentleman visited the Prime Minister in his mm -hmm. normal shorts, and the Prime Minister commented as to how simple and open yeah. were. he welcomed the, the, the gentleman because mm -hmm. he, it was beyond just the dress code and that whole. Um, colonial yeah. type of stuff but here it is this gentleman's contribution towards football within the nation is greater than that foolishness mm -hmm. and you're right the, the, Tobago did make that simple move mm -hmm. that impacted on the people and the culture and I'm saying you're right progressive yeah and this this, this some of the policies that you would have been implementing would have been towards progression of course in every sphere because we were looking at things such as the decriminalization or in our case the legalization of marijuana um, a controversial topic, topic yes. we looked at um, also abortion rights something that a lot of people tend to talk about in a very derogatory way, but they still don't even know the legislation or the laws of the country because <laughs> abortion is legal in Trinidad and Tobago and has been for some time. Okay. Um, people are able to get an abortion through certain steps, steps. or processes. Yes. Um, it has to be where the child may be a threat to the life of both the mother and the, the, the fetus. Yes. Um, in, in cases of rape and, and so forth, there are avenues for that. Uh, you have to have a doctor write off and so forth. So we have avenues and we were not talking anything Thing that was distant because there are people who experience certain things. If we want to tackle, let's say, a, another controversial issue, um, HIV AIDS, mm -hmm. all right? Um, we put money toward that kind of work, but just imagine if you had the Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago, because when we look at gender affairs, it is within the office of the, of Prime, the Prime Minister, Minister yes. but you had the Prime Minister say, 2023 is the year that we do everything within our remit to stop the spread of HIV AIDS and you get all stakeholders on board. The work, you now start to work smarter as opposed to harder yes. because you have signaled to the country this is, this is what we're going to going tackle. Towards, yeah. It's simply about putting vision and presenting that vision to the rest of the country. Um, so we can tackle so many issues with the right kind of leadership no. or the right kind of approach to mm -hmm. it. And it is not rocket science. Mm -hmm. It's you're looking for the skill sets that you would appreciate walking down the street and someone addresses your approach. And I, 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 I hear you with it. I hear you with those things, those, those progressive thoughts. I mean, some of them in which I, I share mm -hmm. um, and endorse, but given, and this is a question I have always, I asked everyone uh, who came here, um, given the present governance structure mm -hmm. and our systematic structure, all right, the need for change of those things, because yeah. all these lofty ideas and policies, suggestions, etc., well, um, they sound good in manifestos, they look good in manifestos mm -hmm. as well too, but getting into the system, the framework of how our governance structure is set up, do you believe, I mean, this is my opinion, I believe it should, but yeah. I want to hear your thoughts on it. Do you believe there's a need to review, even get rid of some of the structures and some of the bureaucratic systems that we have because they are, okay, they don't yeah. fit well, they will not fit well with policies and innovations that we would want to see going forward? Constitutional reform Great. is essentially what you say. Um, but my thought on that is that it is needed, hands down. We need to, to do away with the current constitution, put in place a new constitution. We need to look at things such as savings clauses because those are things that are keeping us back and any um, person within the legal field would understand. But to break it down, because we, we've changed our constitution where we had the independence one and, and well, the republicanism, well, the republican constitution. Um, not much different. There were yes. a lot of changes changes that were proposed mm -hmm. and we know about the Hewitting um, commission, commission and so yes. forth uh, but we have not really put those kinds of changes in places that is why we have problems with the public service yes. for instance yes. and many other aspects um, mm -hmm. so the savings clauses essentially said before um, the enforcement of, of this constitution or whatnot all laws prior to it will stand right yeah um, but it speaks to, I believe it is section five or six of the, of, of the um, constitution that actually speaks to that. Mm -hmm. And we get the whole issue about human rights and so yes. forth because it's the Bill of Rights. Mm -hmm. But this isn't a law class. No, so no, no. <laughs> jumping back onto the, uh, the point, Pazio Pandey has been, and I have to kind of turn my attention toward him, he has been yes. really pushing this uh, mm -hmm. notion of constitutional reform. Again, it is necessary, but respectfully, I think it is ill-timed. Mm -hmm. I think that what we should really be focusing on is the bread and butter issues, the things that impact on people on a daily basis, and gradually 
systematically get them to start thinking about how the broken constitution is limiting the kind of representation they can be afforded. But no, but Nicole, I, I hear you, mm -hmm. but I mean, you got to ill time. Then the question is, suppose, when would be the time? No, it, it, uh, and, and yeah. therefore, I have, there were attempts. Mm -hmm. Uh, Pandey, I think last um, government, the partnership government, mm -hmm. made an attempt to begin the, to turn the wheels then towards that direction. I, I wouldn't mean, call that an attempt, but well, yeah. uh, but who <laughs> and, and this is where my this is where my concern is. Which government, mm -hmm. given the present system, you know, mm -hmm. will is willing to take the bull by the horn? Right. With regards to beginning the process, sure, may not get the whole thing done what, what in five I, years. Yeah, Cannot. of course. But what I want you to understand is, when I say ill-timed, mm. it's a matter of all right. You have this big, let's for all intents and purposes, say lofty idea, because many people see a change in the constitution, getting a three-fifths majority or whatever it is, as being lofty, a pie in the sky thing. <laughs> I don't believe that's the case. It's a matter of how you work smartly to get to that point. Yes. And so if what you are going into communities and saying, and I'm not accusing um, the former prime minister of, of these things, but what I'm saying, if you go into communities and you talk about, yes, constitution reform, you go on the, on the line um, in, in Marabella there, and you start to talk, well, my platform, what I'm running on is constitutional reform. They're going to watch you like you're mad. Yes. We come in and tell me about that Con for. Yes. I can't get water and you tell me about constitutional Correct. reform. Correct. So what I'm saying is that we have to start speaking the language yes. of the people, getting them to know that, hey, we do have your best interests at heart. Mm -hmm. This is the plan to get you water. Yes. All right. If I am um, afforded the opportunity, this is how I will do it. Yes. You understand? And while there, once you've gotten the support of the people and so forth, you start injecting into their minds the notion of constitutional reform. You use your office, the position that you have, to put out public service announcements. You start up with a referendum or whatnot. You and, put things in I'm, place. Yes, yes. So <laughs> that's why I'm saying it's ill-timed. Okay, okay. um, not saying that we cannot have the conversation, yeah. but just know that there is going to be a large segment of society that is going to be tuned out mm -hmm. because that's not what they want to hear. So the beginning of the law the beginning to deal with low-hanging fruits can be something that, ought, yeah. that should be considered. And, and it, it, right. it, it is easier saying, in the most basic way, you had again first to fix anything. Well, yeah, true. Especially as you relates to the Constitution, because you can't be on the outside, and, right. and how are you going to pass the law or, or, or whatnot. So you have to start thinking, mm -hmm. listen, even... And I'm not saying that you have to be a politician to take up this, this course because uh -huh. you can be agitating and looking to see who are the members of parliament and you go to them and you say, well, listen, these are the proposals. This is what people want to see and so forth. But it is a process. It's a number of steps you have to take and, and you but, get but, to that and point. I, but therefore, I think that's why I think us as advocates on the ground outside and, and communities should be encouraging that sort of, that sort of um, messaging in, in, in forcing the hands of the, those who are in parliament and government to really begin the discussion. I mean, you may not be able to get things correct at right away, but there are certain things. So like, for example, you have around, um, mm -hmm. I think there's a need to, dis to, to, to explore those ideas. There's a need to explore how we select our house mm -hmm. speaker. There's a need to explore how we, expect, how we um, elect our president. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying that because there, there are so, there, there's so many examples all over the world, <coughs> all right? So we may not be able to get the book right. Yeah. A simple thing like, okay, if we get that, Point of um, point through with regards to prime ministers serving two terms. Mm -hmm. All right, come on. I mean, so those low hanging fruits. I'm saying that in conjunction yeah. with the bread and butter issues, mm -hmm. which is necessary. I'm um, saying that we can begin that thinking. All right, because I, I, I far too many times you you hear yes, you can't get into you cannot do anything on from the outside. You have to get in to do something, but. Um, I know to have fact there are many yeah, governments, no, there yeah. are many gov parties, sorry, when get into government, mm -hmm. are very, they tiptoe around those things, you know, because when they get in, they like how the system yeah. functions. So it's a, but then, you know who <laughs> I blame? I don't blame them, you know, no. because you see them politicians, and they, yeah. if you want to be honest, they're smart, because yeah. they come and they tell you whatever, Correct. and then they get Correct. in. We Correct. are the ones to blame, That's because right. at the end of the day, 
you go on your jump up and you put on a red jersey or a yellow jersey That's and correct. you don't even listen to what the candidate is saying. Facts. So it is your fault because yes. you went and stained your finger for someone who was aligned with a particular political party mm -hmm. and when you get in and they're not performing, you're shocked. How yes. could you How be? Could you? you understand? Yes. Did you take them to task? Did you ask them what is their position on X, Y, Z issue? And if we're not doing those things, then how can we seriously say that um, we are uh, we deserve better. Yes. Let me put it like that. I mean, at the most basic level, I think that we deserve the best kind of governance we because this is a beautiful we place, Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, but we have to work for that. Yes. We have to be willing to go outside in the hot sun and, yeah. and march in a, in a, a real way. Yes. When I say march, because you see the idea of people going and walking around the savannah to bring attention to an issue. For me, what that does more than anything is build community, a sense of community. Because yes. you see people coming together who say, I support this issue. Yes. And yes. so for. It does not do much for actual political change, change or legal yeah. change or policy change. It does not. No. And we have to be honest about that. But if we start growing the community more and more and we can start working smarter. So for instance, and I'm not one to tell people how to protest yes. yeah, because that is everyone's individual right, right. Yeah. whether they see it fit to go burn tires or whatnot. I would be doing a disservice by telling you you shoulda, woulda, coulda. Mm -hmm. You understand? However, an approach that can be taken. Instead of gathering in one place and it's X number of you and all the police swoop down and, and, and catch you or whatever it is, be strategic about it. We have a number of ministers. Find out where their ministries are. And you come there in groups and you put forward a message and each group is saying whether it's the Prime Minister, whether it is the Minister of Trade, whether it is so by so and you're agitating in front of their office. And it's not just about making noise. You come forth with a document yes. and you say these are the things that we are asking for. Just imagine how that would happen if it were one day in the country. And the multiple entire, yes. protests yes. taking yes. place, demonstrations if you would, taking place at the same time. I think that would have a more powerful impact because people will see more than anything that you're coordinated. That's right. And then you're bringing something, you're bringing something to the table with regards to information and mm -hmm. what you want to see. Mm -hmm. And just not bringing some tires to burn and smoke in the place and mm -hmm. to disrupt the whole thing and then at the end of the day, what? Right? So, but, but, I mean, but, and, and I want to no, say no, no, even I, with those things, yeah, because I, 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 I can imagine your position on it and I'm sure that we will be yeah, the yeah, same yeah. way. I, I see. Um, those things have their place in society. That's correct. Yeah? That's correct. Because at the I end think. of the day, um, had it not been for that entire ruckus mm -hmm. that took place earlier this week, we would not have gotten some of the answers or the decisions or the, um, right. the, the movements that That's we're right. seeing there. Mm -hmm. What is a problem is why are you stoning innocent civilians who are simply making their way to work or home or what have it? Yeah. They had nothing to do with that. Yes. And someone put it across beautifully on the radio that I heard earlier. Um, these are the same individuals, because I know one young woman who I, is a friend of mine um, in Facebook and on, in real life. She was saying that she was in a maxi while this was taking place and um, the residents were throwing stones at the maxi and so forth. She is someone who lobbies a lot and has been active and involved. What you've just done is lost an ally. Yes. Yes. And that's not what you want to be doing in these times. You mm -hmm. want more people to see your cause, understand it, and be willing to stand with you. You don't want to run them away. Mm -hmm. The amount of people who may now have to go and repair their windshields and, yeah. and so yeah. forth, they did nothing to deserve that, mm -hmm. you understand? So we have to strike a delicate balance. At yes. the end of the day, it's not like if anyone went into Bitha or Silas or whatnot and said, well, this is protesting 101. Yeah. They are doing what they feel is it's the best the response. Yeah. And I cannot fault them for that. I was telling my grandmother, I say at the end of the day, um, we can't just say, uh, look what they're doing and, and write them off and so forth. Uh, because she, she may be of the opinion that they should be doing X, they should be doing Y. At the end of the day, we are not doing enough to change the culture in those areas That's and to support right. them and to ask them That's what are right. the problems. Before it reach because the if you want to see all these people gathering in and, and living in Bitha in a particular way and the environment and stuff, mm -hmm. are we offering them HDC houses? Are mm -hmm. we offering them an opportunity to relocate? Mm -hmm. Are we putting those <laughs> systems in place? And the fact is, no. So we're not doing enough to eradicate the issue or to really arrest the issue. We are there pointing fingers, complaining and so forth. And 
yes, we have the eSport of Speed Development Company. Yeah. Yes, we might have the MP passing through one and whatnot, but it is not enough. This is an issue that is a whole of Trinidad and Tobago issue. Wow. If we want to help the communities of Beetham and Laventil and Sealots and Embakadi and Ware Enterprise and so forth, it has to be an all of Trinidad and Tobago approach. Uh, uh, approach. And yes. we're not getting that right now mm -hmm. because we simply feel, well, it's for the divisional police in that area to deal with or the people in that area to deal with. Mm -hmm. uh, look, I was in Portisby in the morning where the uh, three young men lost their lives in, on Independence Square with yes. the police shooting. Um, I was there and I saw the area cordon off. I saw the blood on the side of the vehicle and I was wondering what was happening. Mm. I don't have to be living in town or um, constantly in town to be affected by the things that happen in town. Yes. Much the same way that we should understand that the people in Port of Spain don't have to be living in, in San South. Fernando yes. to be impacted or affected in one way by what is taking place down here. So it has to be an all of Trinidad and to Tobago be approach. approach because it affects all of us in one way or the other. Great. Your thoughts, um, because we want to wind down now, sure. um, your thoughts on the approach of the government towards the low-hanging fruits and mm -hmm. dealing with the issue of the... Because I, I, I asked all the politicians their opinion on the um, recently um, passage of the um, local government reform mm -hmm. bill. I mean, mm -hmm. just to skim it, because, I mean, this is your, this is your first interview. We definitely going to be... Uh, but even, on, even on, on that one, yeah. because I had the, the pleasure of going through that legislation and I looked at it um, in Parliament in different debates so I'm very much accurate with it and it is a step in the right direction. I think that Great. the UNC's claims um, that it was not good um, legislation and so forth I think is ill-placed because it is a step. Now there are things that could have been better in the yes. legislation mm -hmm. um, and one of my grievances has been that it was since 2016 or so I think that this government was seeing that um, we're putting local government la legislation in, in, in yeah, the forefront mm -hmm. but the messaging that was being sent which was particularly confusing to me was if you voted for us in local government elections we will put this in place. <laughs> local government <laughs> elections and local government councils have absolutely nothing to do with the legislation in Parliament. The government is already elected and existing in place. That's so it is there. So whether the PNM lost the election in 2016 or the not, they are still there yeah. and they mm -hmm. still have the votes and they can still push things mm -hmm. forward. So to put that out of the way, um, I think that uh, it is a step in the right direction. Yeah. We will see a certain level of autonomy existing around the, the uh, municipal corporations and that is something that I greatly welcome. Yes. Uh, I think that you would have councillors getting um, fair pay now. Um, their but position, we trust. We hope yeah, so. yeah. Um, <laughs> their positions will become substantive yeah. as opposed to a kind of part-time situation. So all of those things, even municipal police, um, there the would be responsibilities are going to be a little more right, and and you would have people responsible for education and health within the um, the, the, the municipal corporation. So those things I, I greatly welcome, um, and. I know that when it comes to low-hanging fruit, the approach of the government, I personally think is not a good one. Because traditionally, and there are those who might want to argue with me, and I could care less. <laughs> yeah, <you're> right. <laughs> the PNM has traditionally been about um, institutional uh, institutional projects, mega projects and stuff, things, um, vision as well, eh? yeah. looking I toward think, bigger yes. things. Yeah. But the approach to it has not been as people-centered as, let's say, the United National Congress, because I think they are seen more as a, uh, not necessarily the term a grassroots party, but they will quicker deal with the bread and butter issues, you understand? Um, and so this has worked for and against both parties, parties yes. over the years. Um, this government, the PNM government, I think is still on track with a lot of those bigger projects. Mm -hmm. Slowly we're seeing more community focused projects taking place, but it may be a case of too little, too late, mm -hmm. because I think generally the country is fed up and believes better can be done and should be allowed to be done. So the same dress code policy, when that took place in Tobago, the media then turned their attention to the Minister of Public Administration in Alison West, Senator Alison West. She said it was not the priority of the government at this point in time. <laughs> I will never expect a dress code policy to be priority for government. 
But this is why you have multiple ministers and multiple ministries and technocrats. You assign and you delegate responsibilities. Correct. And so it may not be the focus of the government, but you at least know there is a committee who is working on presenting a paper to cabinet that says this is how we change the policy, effect it, sign off on it and move forward. <laughs> and so we have to stop seeing government as being or having its hands tied because there are many things that our government can do if it is to properly utilize its power, its reach, its reign. Um, and I'm just not seeing that. Well, I'm not seeing I it. agree with you, and, and therefore, uh, and hence the reason why I, I, I say openly, I, I, um, I look at that young man in Tobago, mm -hmm. and um, I see where his headpiece is. I believe I, I can share some of his passion in mm -hmm. the sense that he mm -hmm. is tackling some of the issues, mm -hmm. um, taking the bull by the horn, and really making that impact where it matters most. The people or to benefit. Agreed. All right? And I mean, when I look at the, the I mean, people focusing, and as I said, I said this on many occasions, and a lot of focus was placed on Mr. Duke. Mm -hmm. You understand? And, and Mr. Duke and Mr. Duke and Mr. Duke, and not realizing that at the end of the day, Farley and the team and, the, yeah. and the, where they want to go, is it, they're going in a particular direction, friend. Mm -hmm. The bread and butter issues. Let's focus on those things. Mm -hmm. People more dry. Correct. People fed up. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, <laughs> lastly, um, Nikolai, because uh -huh. we are nine. Yes, we are nine or one. One minute to go. Yeah. Um, I want to, only because I know you said you were part of the in, um, the procurement. Yeah, public public procurement. I'm thinking. Mm -hmm. Your thoughts on that? Because I know that's a great issue. Yeah. I would guarantee just to share. you spoke about the, the reason one. Why hasn't that been implemented yeah. as yet? Um, your thoughts on it? Very strong thoughts on it and yeah. condensed. I think that the government is intentionally dragging its feet. The Attorney General, Reginald Moore, is talking absolute rubbish as it relates to um, the need to go back out and get information and so forth because uh, of what the judiciary, the opinion um, that the judiciary delivered um, to his office just on the entire matter. You're telling me that after this legislation was passed since 2015, wow. your own now soliciting the thoughts of the judiciary they have had these views for some time and so I think that the government is intentionally dragging its feet there's absolutely no reason why we cannot effect the public procurement and disposal of public property Act 2015 because the office of procurement regulation has been working to in day into night to make sure all public bodies are fully apprised of the legislation and the regulations having sat on that board and been involved firsthand with the work, yeah. a lot of work went, went, into, went into, it. into it. And the reason why this is not being put in place is because it is going to impact on how the government essentially is able to procure. Uh, and of course, the political parties, the individuals who occupy these offices. So until, unless the government figures out a way to deal with it, and it has been treating with it um, through amendments, because we saw um, I think it was in 2019 or thereabout or sometime after, we saw the government coming to Parliament and removing the clause or the aspect of government to government procurement. Why is that? Uh, it shouldn't be, yes, you understand? Yes. So it's taking away certain oversight from the Office of Procurement Regulation that I don't think should be taken away. And then we've been hearing about the regulations time after time, time after time, finally they reached the Parliament and so forth. But we then find another issue. <laughs> and I'm sure if we tackle that issue, we're going to find, find another, another one. So, so the government, I blame the it. government, and it is a coordinated hmm. uh, attempt to stop this legislation from being fully proclaimed. There is no reason we cannot, again, taking an all-of-government approach, get this thing done, um, all the kings and whatnot, in a couple months' time. Yes. Put that as priority. Uh -huh. Say, you know, um, we are in July now. By September, jump high, jump low, we're going to proclaim it and get everybody on board. So every office or whoever in whatever ministry who has a role and a function to play in this work will do it. Yes. And we work smartly and we get it done. Hand hand. Your closing comments, sir? Um, um, closing comments, I mean, I, I really want people out there to understand that work is taking place across Trinidad and Tobago, but I want them to get involved with the work. And when I say the work, I'm talking about people are willing to represent you, your community, your country. Yes. It is not a case where you simply look and you see, well, okay, another candidate, let me just hear what he, go out and look for them. And furthermore, if you hear what candidates are saying um, and you like it, 
find out from them how you can support them in a more meaningful way. Because sometimes it might be donating of a case of water, it might be coming and helping <laughs> set up um, a tent and some chairs for a, a cottage meeting or whatever it is. There are ways that people can get involved. Yes. Uh, so if you are feeling unproductive, if you're feeling as though your hands are tied, you can't do anything to help Trinidad and Tobago, think again. There yes. are avenues and we need you. This country needs every single citizen uh, that exists here and abroad to help us get on, on, on track. It is possible. Yes. It is in the future something that I'm sure we can grasp and see, but we have to be willing to work with one another. Thank you very much. So there you go, ladies and gentlemen. We want to thank Mr. Edwards for joining, uh, joining us here this evening um, and to our episode, fifth episode of Knowing your representative, he is in fact a representative, the founding um, leader <laughs> of the Progressive Party. Um, Nikolai, we'd like to thank you for coming on. We'd like thank to thank you. you for accepting the invitation. Um, and likewise, to all of you who have been viewing and listening to us on, the, on Facebook, YouTube, and all other social platforms, we want to thank you for joining us here this evening. And stay tuned to other episodes to come. Uh, we want to thank you once again, and do have a very good evening. The views expressed on this show is not necessarily the views of NCBNTT Television. Councillor for Monrepo Nevet, Nigel Cotier presents Splash, Splash, Bubbles and Foam, a premier children's event on Saturday the 9th of July 2022 at 3 p.m. on the Monrepo grounds. Bring out the kids to have an epic start to the July-August vacation, both wet and dry areas for extra fun. Water slides, foam machines and bubble machines. Don't want to be in the wet zone? No problem, your councillor got you covered. Lots of activities for you as well. Carnival games and bouncy castle, bungee run with basketball, rock climbing, tiger ride, double slides and lots more. Admission is free, free, free. Don't miss out. Loads of fun for the entire family. Food and drinks would be on sale at the venue. Splash, Splash. bubbles and foam. Saturday the 9th of July 2022. See you there. Children's Story Time with Auntie Katie is coming soon only on NCBN TT Television.